Local number three, people of the state of New York versus Sean Sivertson, council. Good morning, Your Honor, or good afternoon, I should say. Good afternoon. May it please the court, Ms. Lowry. May I have two minutes for rebuttal, please? You may. Your Honors, I'd like to address the second point in our brief, if I may, the patent issue, if I may. I'll answer any questions the court has otherwise. But to jump into it, this was an ordinary felony investigation, and the warrant rule applied. In order for the officer's conduct to be legal under the Fourth Amendment, it must be reasonable at its inception and at every stage along the way. And to rebut the presumption of unreasonableness, which attaches to every warrantless entry, one of the narrowly defined exceptions to the warrant rule must apply, which means that in our case, the officer's conduct in bursting into my client's tiny apartment must have been to resolve or address an urgent need under the exigent circumstances exception. Counselor, why isn't this a mixed question? Judge, it is a mixed question of law and fact that, um, and, and um, this type of case has been addressed before in that regard. What we would say is that there isn't record support for the appellate division's resolution of the issue of the urgent need. Uh, Does it have to be just on that issue, counsel? Because under McBride, there were several factors and the list was not exhaustive. So if some of the factors have record support, but this particular factor does not, does that mean that we can't find that there's record support? I, th I think that the, the purpose of McBride, and I guess I would point specifically to page 446 of the decision, the, the, the prime inquiry that the court is concerned about is the urgent need. The factors in McBride were supposed to be to assist suppression courts. It was, as Your Honor had just mentioned, they weren't supposed to be an exhaustive list. And I, I think it, it might be a good example here to contrast our situation with McBride. Um, the officers in that case came to the scene and pretty much reacted to the situation in a similar way to the officers in our case, at the beginning at least. They were looking through the window and investigating. But in McBride, what they saw was one person was lying on the ground, someone else was running for the door, and another person came to the door in great distress. And this court, again, on that same page of the decision, noted that it was once that presentation at the door took place, the person was in need, that's what the court found to be the urgent need, which is the prime reason for the exigent circumstances you're, exception. You're not uh, disputing that the factors that deal with probable cause are are resolved. They're non-issues in this case, so then of course they waive in, they weigh, excuse me, in favor of, of the people. I, I understand the argument in that regard that's against us. Um, I think the, as far as the factors go, I think probably our strongest arguments have to do with um, the gravity of the offense below as well as the potential for escape, because I think this case is, is an easy contrast to a situation like People versus Burr. If the court will recall, in Burr, um, this court described Mr. Burr's conduct as savagery. It was, a, it was a situation where he had stabbed someone in the face, in the mouth, and he happened to mention to a witness that he was going to go to Texas. So we have two of the factors right there that would be given a great amount of weight, not as much in our case. Yes, Your Honor. But counsel, so where we are now is we've had this finding which has been made, right, this determination has been made, the Pell Division has ruled. So I, it seems to me our review here is limited, right? It's limited to whether there is evidence in the record to support that determination. So we've just been having this discussion about the factors and the weight, and I think some of this is suggesting, isn't that a very difficult hurdle for you to overcome where it's a balancing of factors? I mean, you'd have to redo the balance in some way because clearly some of the factors are here. Um, so how do we apply that standard in an argument based on the McBride factor balancing test? Well, I, I guess two things, Judge. Number one, those factors are just, they're considerations for the ultimate question of whether there is an urgent need. And I know your, court, your Honor wasn't saying differently. But what the appellate division found here, one, one thing the appellate division seized upon here uh, was the fact that the officers did not know about other exits, whether they were exits or not. But the court also found that he was being watched the whole time. So our, our position is if someone is, it's a very rare circumstance, if someone is being watched the entire time, even if there's 15 exits in this place, how many times did they say during the suppression hearing that this is a very small apartment? The number of exits are just irrelevant, and that is something that the appellate division Does the record upon. indicate how many police officers were there at the time? There was, a, there was somewhere between 10 and 20 in the area five went in. 
10 or 15, I think, is close to that were actually upon uh, the residents from the outside. It, it seems we'd have to, uh, Mr. Murphy, we'd have to re, it wouldn't be a balancing of factors. We'd be basically saying one factor, the nature of the offense or the geography or the layout of the apartment would outweigh all the other factors because they clearly seem to meet it. At least it seems in my view, four of the six factors that, that are on the McBride list. And I think that you'd have to add the geography of the apartment to it. I think that's fair. Um, but in essence, we'd be saying that this one factor would outweigh everything else. And isn't that uh, purely a, uh, a factual determination or, or, or a balancing test for that's kind of inappropriate for the Court of Appeals. Well, but the, the, the elements that the appellate division was focusing in on, I think the court can review for sure, mm -hmm. and that the, the suppression court found. And what the court was focusing in on, mostly about the escape at least, was the number of, of, of potential places to exit, mm -hmm. which is, is not really a factor based on these established facts here. It, it, it's not an issue of, of consequence at all. Um, I, I think what's unusual about this situation is that you're coming upon the scene and for some reason we're able to watch the defendant the entire time. Even if there was some hint that he could possibly escape, they would see him right away and seize upon that situation. But was there, there was also, and I'm sorry if I have the facts wrong, um, but wasn't there some indication that there might be a way to get into other um, apartments or in other part of this building? So would the concern be, and again, it seems to me this is very factual, would the concern only be he can escape, or would it also be he just recently, within the hour, committed an armed robbery, so there might be access to others in this building? No, uh, that, that was a concern, that, that was something that, mentioned, that was mentioned by Officer Mayhook, uh, but I don't believe there's anything in the record to establish that they knew that there was any link from the apartment to any other apartment. But if they didn't know if there was, wouldn't that be a factor? I mean, if you're standing outside and you don't know, you don't have the blueprints for the place, you do know certain things which are in the record, but wouldn't you have to say they didn't know that? At the beginning of every investigation, it's understandable for the officers to perhaps um, deal with elements of the unknown. However, here, there was this intervening event of them being able to watch him. So therefore, even if there was access to other rooms from his, other apartments from his apartment, they would see him immediately and, seize and you'd have to have the calculation, would be your calculation, and that they would have enough time, no matter how many people they had outside, to get through the door and stop him from doing whatever they think he's going to be doing now that they don't see him. Well, they're going to, they're going to see if he leaves his But couldn't, bed. before that, if they have all these officers, can't they go into the building and, 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 and ascertain whether there's access or not, if they're able to watch him, and then if, if they can no longer watch him, then of course, there may be an urgency. And weren't there other people that they, in fact, spoke to in advance, That's knowing correct, to find out if he was in that building? That's correct, Your Honor. That's true. Counsel, uh, what about I the standard that uh, courts should be careful not to second-guess police officers, assess on-the-scene assessment of a possible, possibly dangerous situation unfolding? Well, what do we do with that? Well, I, and that certainly is a concern, Judge. Yeah. But what, what I believe this court has said a number of times, when we're approaching the warrant rule, the potential exceptions to the warrant rule have to be narrowly defined. We have to go about this in a way where the exceptions are narrowly approached. I, I, may I just make one, yes, one quick comment? Um, there isn't any question that these officers are piecing together what's going on here. The breadcrumbs kind of bring them to my client's mm -hmm. apartment. But once they are seeing him there, and they're able to continuously see him, it seems like they've, they've done this out of frustration, which I know that this court does not believe is an exception to the rule. When they get there, what do they actually see? They're actually, they see him watching TV. Um, he's not responding to their request to come to the door. So he's aware he's, they're out there. That's correct. And what does he do once he's aware they're out there? At one point, he closes his eyes. Um, he doesn't make an escape. He doesn't make a break no, for it, as they say. He doesn't make a break for it. There's no evidence being destroyed, and there's no other individual that is being hurt Thank there. You. Just one more question, yes, Counsel. Getting back Please. to your point about it has to be limited. So aren't these limited circumstances, given the immediacy of this pursuit and the um, circumscribed nature of the actual search it's for an arrest, not for a full-blown search? They're not, Your Honor. And, and the contrast I would make would be McBride. 
they have the basic factors as background, being assistance to the court analyzing it, but then there are exigent circumstances at the scene that puts it over the top and, and, and compels the officers to make a warrantless entry. The exception, I would say, other than seeing things at the scene, would be the Burr situation, where you're dealing with someone who has done a savage crime that has indicated he's going to escape, and you know where he is. Mr. Burr not responding is an exigency, based on what the police knew, but not under these circumstances. Well, this was someone who had just committed an armed robbery, correct? He had flashed a knife, that's true, Judge, but there, there was some dispute in that. But yes, there was an allegation of a recent, a, a recent robbery, that's true. Thank you, Counsel. Counsel? May it please the Court, Ashley Lowry on behalf of the people. There is record support for the hearing court's determination that the entry based on exigent circumstances was lawful and defendants what were attempts those circumstances, Counsel, that you say were so exigent that a warrant was not necessary in this case? The focus here is not whether defendant would have used violence. I mean, we have some allegations. The police officers talked about it during their testimony. And it's violence against the responding police as well as the other people. But it's whether the police officers reasonably believed that he might do so. Well, but wouldn't that then give the officers the right to um, uh, enter without a warrant in any situation in which they had reasonable cause, probable cause, whatever, to believe that the person in there had committed uh, a violent crime? I don't think it would be so broad. I mean, obviously, well, what, every... what makes this different, especially it, to me, it seems like the, the difference, if any, would be go the other way because of the, the peculiar facts of the case where the apartment was so small and they could see everything he was doing. So what makes this different from any other case in which they, they track a, a suspected um, a criminal down to, to their apartment, why can't they just go in without a warrant any time? Based upon the steps that the police officers took, they were trying to ascertain the scene. They couldn't really determine how small that apartment was until they got into it. You know, they tried to speak to the residents at the scene to determine whether or not How there long were, were they points. there, counsel? I'm how sorry? Long were, how long were the police officers there before they went in? Um, I believe it was about 20 minutes, and then they were knocking on the windows and doors trying to get the defendant's attention for approximately 10 minutes, and he made eye contact, he rolled over. I mean, none of the officers testified that he was sleeping. They all testified that he was watching TV. Well, he, didn't, then, he didn't make an escape, right? He didn't move off his bed to a window, to a door, to a corner in the apartment, did No, he, he did not No, he didn't. Time. So if he knew they were there, would that not have been the moment to do so, rather than sit around and wait for them to perhaps break through that door and slow down sure. the amount of escape time? I'm not sure what was going through defendant's mind, but the police officers also did not know, and that is included the, in the, the testimony the, below. The difficulty I'm having, counsel, with the police officers not knowing things is that if they come to my house, they don't know how big it is. They don't know how many exits there are. They don't know if I have knives. I actually have knives in the kitchen because I cut vegetables from time to time. They don't know whether I have a gun. I don't. I've never owned a gun. But they don't know any of that. So to justify a warrantless entry on the basis that the police officers genuinely don't know about the circumstances, those things seem to me to be very difficult. The police officers testified that they believed themselves and the other residents were in danger. That is, you know, included in the record but, but, at pages you know, 96 back to and 97. Judge Abdul Salam's question, it's why. It's not what they believed. It, it's what is the evidence on which they could reasonably rest that belief. I believe it fits squarely within the McBride factors. Here we have defendant that just recently committed, you know, an armed robbery. He had a knife and held up this this store directly across from where he lived. They had not yet recovered that weapon. They believed that he was still armed. Three officers, three out of the eight officers testified that, that they believed he was armed and they believed he posed a danger to the community, to the residents. Okay, so that, that then is a question. So is it the case that a warrantless entry is allowed whenever the police have probable cause to believe the person inside his home has a weapon that was recently used to commit a robbery? No, that would be, again, that would be broad. I, I agree that that would be problematic. But if we're looking and we're applying all of these factors as well as, you know, additional circumstances that we have here, I mean, the court below relied on 
you know, So are you saying this would be a different circumstance if it was a one-family house? I don't think that goes, that doesn't apply everything that we have here. Another factor that the police so testified to. So even if it was to, a one-family house, maybe there were other people in the house, right? Correct. So but again, I'm trying to know. figure out how do, how do we narrow down, I think that uh, Judge Wilson and I are, are sort of both honing in on the same, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, difficulty we're having with this argument. Yes. Defendant was also unresponsive. And he was unresponsive after he had made eye contact with the police. And but isn't that the point? He doesn't have to respond to them, but he didn't try to do anything. He just stayed in his bed. Are However, you saying that the only way an individual in their home can avoid someone breaking down the door is to actually go to the door and open the door and engage with the police? No, I mean, that would be to ignore all of the other circumstances here. I mean, he was unresponsive. They believed that he was still armed and that he did have, a, you know, a weapon was used and that he was still armed. You know, they had that probable but, cause. But the weapon they knew about was a knife and the door was closed, the windows were down. I, I might, you know, I don't want to draw a real distinction between knives and guns, but I can't see his laying in bed with the door closed the, the police are so afraid that he's going to what, throw the knife and hit whom and a, at a closed door. I, I'm, I'm really not clear about what you're saying about the dangerous weapon here. I'm, I'm not suggesting that a knife couldn't be a dangerous weapon in some circumstances, but under these circumstances, I'm not seeing. Yes. I mean, the police did make attempts to verify whether or not this particular apartment was a attached or, you know, if there were other ways for the f defendant to go. So had he exited that room and gone, you know, in toward the house, was he going to an additional residence? Was he going to the upper? Was he going to the front unit? Was he going to the basement? There was no way for them to verify that after speaking to... There were no, to... no officers in the hallways? No. I mean, they went, they spoke to the front resident, but they didn't, they could not reach the, the resident on the top, and they didn't know anything about the basement. Were they posted at the back? Yes, that's actually where the they're apartment They're posted at the was. back, they're posted at the front. The they're looking, they're looking through the windows, the door is locked. They can see him, you've described every move that he's made. But he's where, where, where? This is an exception to the rule. This is not the rule Agreed. that you get to go in, right? It's the exception. Yes. So given that it's an exception, why is it that the officers are unable to get a warrant? Because that's all you're talking about. They just have to get a warrant. No one's saying they can't eventually go in. They seem to have probable cause to do so at some point to convince uh, a magistrate that, to issue a warrant. I mean, the fact is we have this exigent circumstances analysis, which the police officers are able to apply in limited circumstances. I mean, this, this happened isn't, isn't, 825 at night. Doesn't the timing and the geography come into play a little bit here? Agreed, Your Honor. It does. Yes. It, it, it seems Close to me pursuit. that... Yeah, it's, it's in close pursuit. The, 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 the store clerk is there. He flashes a knife and tries to rob a, a jar with uh, um, uh, donations in it. She follows him out, tells, she, she doesn't give it to him. He, he, she chases him out, he runs out of the, the 7-Eleven. She chases him out holding her cell phone, calling the police. Yes. He goes basically two buildings away and directly across the street. Directly, uh, not, not even across the street. I think it's on the same side of the street. And he goes two buildings down, and he goes inside the building, which is a multi-apartment building. The police come in pursuit of him. They find him in the place. Um, uh, this seems to be all, all happening relatively quickly in, with, within a limited geographic area. It's not like the police came upon a house two miles away and uh, uh, were wait and surrounded the house and, and, and saw him sitting inside watching TV. Uh, they were in direct pursuit in response to a call that a victim of the crime had made. Um, what I wonder is, you know, he went into his apartment. Do you think it makes any difference? Let's say he had gone to the basement and hidden. Would the police have had a greater right to go in and, and, and to get him than they would have, say, by him being in his apartment? Does that make any difference? I don't think under these circumstances it really 
um, factors in because we would still be faced with the fact that he entered a part of the building that they could not verify if he could escape or if other people were in danger. Well, are you saying that the McBride factors would, would apply in the same way then? Yes, and I mean, with a basement, it, it's almost, I mean, in a multi-unit house, basements, I, I think most likely would be like a common area. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think we would necessarily be having, you know, it would actually go more in favor. Mm -hmm. um, well, in a basement, you might not be able to see anything. You might know he's gone down there, but you, you don't necessarily see any of true. his movements, right? Yeah, however, there were only the two small windows that they could see into, and there were three officers who but, were able uh, to but, kind of but, peer but, in. But the testimony is that they could see. There, there's no argument that they that it, there was any obstruction. There's no. There's no shades. And all of there, the lights on. Were, all of the lights were on inside yeah, the, the apartment. Yeah, the TV is he was on. Fully clothed underneath the covers. I mean, they did not believe that he was sleeping. There, they couldn't understand why he wasn't responding to them. Well, because no one has to. Because no one has to. He doesn't have to. It sounds to me like you're arguing that he he actually had to engage with the police officers. He doesn't have to. No, but they believed that he was armed and he was dangerous. So did, the defendants. Did, did you argue the hot pursuit? Not below, theory? Your Honor. Okay. No, we are limited here to the exigent circumstances. But I believe that the record contains ample evidence and ample support for that determination, based on defendant's description, his location, the timeliness, the seriousness of the crime, and his apparent dangerousness. Well, obviously, the store manager was willing to chase him down. So I guess she didn't think that little pen knife was so dangerous. She just on instinct went ahead and she for was some not. time apparently thank you counsel counsel is it your argument that the police when pursuing this man and according to the uh, testimony below they are pursuing an armed robber they locate him through the windows of his apartment they're knocking on the window. They make eye contact with him. They give him, according to the testimony, he gives them a Freddy Krueger kind of look, that he's non-responsive. It's a multiple family dwelling. Is it your argument that based on those facts is elicited that the, it's reasonable to expect the police to set up outside this guy's home and potentially be targets and endanger themselves? Well, not, they're not, I don't believe they're targets themselves, Your Honor, under these circumstances because we well, have a, Also, did I mention that he had his arms underneath a blanket? They couldn't see if he had a weapon? May I address that first, Judge? Yep, I, and I don't, yes, I don't mean please. to go backwards. <laughs> um, it, it, people versus Levon, they, the officers can't place themselves in an exigency. They can't create the ex exigency themselves. They can't enter the residence and then get close to him in close proximity and say, oh, I think he may have a weapon. They have to be in danger on the outside of the building. They were not in danger, as Judge Rivera no, uh, commented in the first oral argument, by a knife being thrown through a window or a door. That aspect, I, I would just note. But, Your Honor, this whole, this whole fluid situation, is, that has to be a concern to any law enforcement officer. However, there are intervening facts here, and the intervening event here is what they observed continuously through that window. It's not like a Mitchell situation where it's just flowing. We have no time for a warrant. They had this under control. The place was surrounded in this. How many times did we hear small apartment in the suppression hearing? They volunteered about seven times how small this was. If he makes a move, they're going to grab him. As far as being unresponsive. So is it your position that if he made a move, that is, he disappeared from sight for a moment, went to the bathroom, went in some exit they couldn't see, at that point, a warrantless entry is justified? Potentially, Judge, if they can't see him anymore, our argument about him being monitored consistently would be gone. I can't imagine that happen happening very quickly or too quickly for the police to react based on the size of this apartment. I, I, our point, Your Honors, is that any investigation of a felony involving a weapon, this is going to be a huge net that's cast if the court finds exigent circumstances here. Yes, Your Honor. Oh, I'm sorry, Judge, I thought you were about to say something. Unless thank there's any questions. Thank you, I thank Counsel. You.